The B-Sides Nova 2019 presentation will begin momentarily. 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 Check, one, two. Is that good? Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. It's really great to be here at B-Sides Nova. This is my third year being here. Well, not here, here. We used to do it at the CIT building uh, down in Reston. Um, so this is our first year at this venue, and an, I, I think this is awesome. I'm, I'm, I hope we keep doing it here. Um, but I've volunteered here, and this is a really cool conference, and it happens right in my backyard, so I get really excited about it. And I'm really glad that all of you are here as well, too. So thanks for coming to my talk about domain fronting. So, what I want to talk about today is domain fronting. I want to kind of demystify this issue for people and sort of shine a light on some of the issues that are surrounding this technique and this tactic. So we're going to get a little bit into the technical bits, but then we're also going to talk a little bit about the, the political issues and the, the policy and things that are sort of surrounding this, why it's been such a hotly debated thing, and what you should do about it. So here's the obligatory who am I? 
Currently, I'm a federal contractor penetration tester red teamer. This is, I'm very new to that. I've uh, mostly been on the defensive side for a long time. So I've done network engineering, um, enterprise IT, um, security analyst, threat hunting, stuff like that. Mostly for federal and defense contractors in this area. So I've gotten a lot of experience out of that. It's been a lot of fun. I am a SANS 504 mentor. So I teach that class here locally. So if you're interested in that, yeah, whatever. Um, uh, Nova Hackers, I'd like to give a plug to them too. So there's a few of us roaming around here. There's a local hacker group, a little collective we meet once a month. Look us up if you're in this area and you're not a part of it, definitely come check it out. So the overview here, I want to I wanna start to demystify the topic, both how it works technically and why, what it sort of takes advantage of, um, how it works so that you can understand that as well. And then, um, but in order to do that, we have to understand how content delivery networks and cloud service providers work. So they're the old internet model of you have a web page that you want to serve to the public and client talks to server, server responds to client, you download a temporary copy of the content, it gets rendered in the browser. That, that whole thing is sort of dead and there, there are good reasons for that and we're gonna touch, touch on those. And then we're gonna talk about what domain fronting is and how it works. We'll talk about the use cases, how, what it can actually be used for. So how and why you would actually do it, right? Then we're gonna put on our blue team hat. We're gonna talk a little bit about identification. We're gonna look at if, if domain fronting was happening on your network, how would you know? How would you go about detecting it? I will touch a little bit on the history, how and when this was discovered. Some of the headlines that have been flying around about it, you've probably seen a few of them. I got really curious. I was doing a job where I was sort of self-tasked to research the tactic and figure out what was going on, how it works, um, to see if we could detect it. And so that's kind of how I initially dug into this. And then how and when you should use it. So sort of a level set on content delivery networks. So as I said before, the old client server model where you have client talking to server, download content, render content, go home, that whole thing is really dead. It doesn't work that way anymore. The new web is a lot more complicated than that. We've introduced complexity, we've introduced a lot of good things. We have performance, we have resilience, we have caching and load balancing and containers and all this great stuff. The web is really decentralized now, whereas it used to be very centralized. So CDNs meet a critical business need, right? If the more clients you have, the more resources you need. So cloud service providers and content delivery networks stepped in to fill that gap. They said, we can make that happen. Well, how did they do that? That's what I wanna get into. So here's the old model, right? You got a web server, you've got a whole bunch of clients. Now I look at this as an engineer and I see a big problem with that. Does anybody wanna call out what the problem is? Single point of failure, that's a good one. But from a availability perspective, what's wrong with this? What if this is a Raspberry Pi? What's the problem with that? Yeah, so a few hundred clients in my little Raspberry Pi is gonna be struggling to hold on to life. A few thousand clients, my little Raspberry Pi is gonna fall over, right? So this doesn't work anymore. As an engineer, I look at this and I think that's horrible. That does not scale, right? So we need a technology that allows us to scale these types of resources, but they weren't designed with that in mind. So the new model is more like this. It's decentralized. So what we do is we take that content and we put it much, much closer to the client. We also have multiple copies of that content so we can deliver a lot more content to the client much faster than we used to be able to. This is all introduced to create efficiencies and speed where it didn't exist before. So all of this kind of comes 
into your experience when you surf the web. So we've got uh, web servers that are now not just single servers, they are farms of servers, right? So it's not client request server, server response to client anymore. It's client sends a request to some server, it may be a cluster of servers, it might be a farm full of servers, you don't know which server you're actually talking to. One of those services, servers is going to service your request and answer back to you. You don't know which one, and you also don't know, as I'm going to demonstrate, that you don't, you don't actually know what server is servicing the end of that request either. So we can get cat memes, cat videos, cat pictures, every, all the cat stuff that you want. We can get that down to the client now a lot faster than we used to be able to because that's why the internet exists, right? All of those bits sort of come together and coalesce in your web browser. Your web browser has the programming to take all of that code and render it back to the client in a localized way. So some of that data that's being pulled in for you is stuff that is local to you geographically, maybe. But we've taken all of that data and we've located it much closer to the client so that it, we can get it to them faster. So that in some cases that might mean locating the, the content closer to internet backbones where there are a lot of clients or where they can just get it faster, right? So the benefits of that are we got a lot more performance. We created load balancing. That's pretty cool. We created caching. That's awesome. However, how did we achieve that? Because there is no technology, there's no like RFC that defines a lot of those bits that make this work. So what we had to do was use the existing technologies, the existing protocols, the existing RFCs and make this work. So that's what they did. They took DNS and they mangled it. They used what are called canonical name records or C name records or alias records and mangled those. And basically the, the CDM provider took over control of your DNS records. Now, you, you have options. As a, as a customer to a CDN, you have options of whether you want to manage your own DNS or if you want them to manage it for you. Most customers opt to have the CDN provider manage it for them because it's just easier. They can do a lot of automatic stuff in the background to mangle those DNS records to make sure that your resources scale and make sure that your records repoint to the right place at the right time. Because the whole, the whole driving force behind this is availability. You want, when clients reach out to your servers, your servers to respond. You want something to answer. So what it does is it manipulates the DNS behavior. And DNS was never really intended to, to act this way. DNS was intended to, to have one record point to one server. But now what we have is records that point to many servers, could be hundreds of servers. But the thing that you're pointing to may not actually be the thing that you think it is. I'm going to demonstrate how that's possible. And this, I think, leads to other issues because this is not the way DNS was designed. So essentially what we're talking about here is inserting a man in the middle between the client and the server. But I would propose to you that it's even worse than that. It's not just a man in the middle. It's a multi-tenant man in the middle. And coming from a defensive perspective, I think about that and I'm not at all comfortable with that. So some network is going to sit between my clients and the servers that they're trying to access and I don't really have any knowledge and I don't have any control over what they're doing. That sounds like a recipe for disaster. So that introduces a security risk that I don't think is fully appreciated at this point. So what is domain fronting? So this is, this is sort of my definition. You know, there's no official definition, there's no SANS definition or anything like that. But in my words, it's an undocumented feature of content delivery networks and cloud service providers that allows clients to covertly proxy web traffic. So it takes advantage of a couple of quirks in the way that CDNs handle their customer traffic. So think back to your OSI model. If you've 
studied for A+, plus, Net+, plus, Sec+, plus, CCNA, any of the Microsoft certifications, you probably remember the OSI model, right? Yeah, I know, they lied to me too. The OSI model, you know, you can look at the different, the different, different layers and you see you know, source, destination, different protocols that go on at each level. Basically what domain fronting is doing is it's using different destination addresses at different layers of the protocol. So at layer three, we have IP addresses. You have a source IP, you have a destination IP. And that's what most of the world sees when your traffic traverses the internet. That's what most of the devices out there see. They see where it's coming from and they see where it's going to. You can't see anything inside the packet, particularly if it's encrypted, right? So when you combine domain fronting, this behavior with encryption via TLS, then this becomes dangerous. Yes, you can do this in unencrypted HTTP, although I don't know why you would. It doesn't really make any sense to do it that way. And, and that'll become a little more clear when I show you what the packet headers look like. So there's some controversy around the topic of domain fronting because of, of who and how it's been used to this point. And so we'll touch a little bit on those issues as well. But what I want to call attention to is the fact that there is some significant risk that's being introduced here that is not fully appreciated by many of the parties involved in this transaction. So the seminal paper on the topic is a white paper that was written by some UC Berkeley researchers. And it's called Blocking Resistant Communication Through Domain Fronting. It's, an, it's not a bad read. So I would strongly recommend you read it if you're at all interested. It's, it's uh, well written, there's demonstrations, there's code. So it's, if you want to create a demo of some kind, that's useful, it's a useful starting point. There are lots of good demos and articles. They've been coming out slow, sort of slowly over the last couple of years. I have a slide at the end where a lot of those links are shared. Um, I set up a gist, so if you, are, if you want to have those links, Get your QR code scanner ready, um, and then you can scan that, and that will take you to a gist where I have all of the links saved. Um, MITRE ATT&CK has picked up on this tactic as well, so they have a decent write-up on it. It's brief, but it, it explains it. The only known use that I can find in public reporting is APT29, and this occurred mostly in 2015, and it was reported on in 2016. So APT29, Cozy Bear, Dukes, take your pick. So the way this works sort of looks like this. So on the left, we have our web clients. And on the right, we have the CDN hosting network. And these are the customers of the CDN, right? These are the people who are paying the CDN provider to host their stuff. So they have web applications, websites, servers, code, whatever it is, they have it living in the hosting network. And then on the left, we have the clients that want to access those resources. In between, we have the CDN's edge network. And there are, in that edge network, there is a cluster of servers, or maybe, maybe many clusters of servers, whose only mission in life is to accept those incoming connections and then make the decision about how to route those. It's not a routing decision necessarily. It's similar to that, but it's, it happens at layers above, right? So this is the man in the middle right here, this edge network. And therein lies the problem. So let's look at the headers. How does this actually work? At layer three, we have IP information. We have a source address. We have a destination address. And this is basically all routers care about. If you go a little deeper and you talk about firewalls and web proxies and all that interesting stuff, excuse me, they might care about other bits, right? But the routers only care about source and destination. In a lot of cases, they don't even care about the source. They really only care about the destination because a router's only job in life is to take the, this packet and figure out where to send it. And they're not even concerned about getting it to its final destination. They're only concerned about the next hop, 
which direction do I send it in? I don't, I don't really care if it gets there, I just want it off my plate, basically. So that's what routers care about. At the TCP, UDP, the session layer, what we have is a bunch of other fields that are not really relevant to this discussion. They're good, they're interesting, they're meaty, but they're not relevant right now. At layers above, what we have in TLS is encrypted HTTP data. So in the past, before we implemented TLS, this would all be in the clear, right? But then the first packet that gets sent in a TLS connection is called the TLS client hello packet. So this is client reaching out to server, server responds back. The, the client hello packet is that initial packet that it sends to the server and says, I want to access you. In that packet, it many times will send what is called the server name indication. So the SNI field is an extension of TLS. Because it's an extension, that means that it's optional. So it may or may not exist. It exists in most traffic, I will say, in my experience. But it doesn't always exist and it doesn't have to exist by the RFC, so it's optional. And then inside that TLS hello packet, there's a bunch of encrypted HTTP data. So this is what your edge network controls, so your firewalls, your web proxies, your IDS, all that good stuff, this is what they see from the outside. So all of those security controls have to make a judgment call as to whether to allow this traffic or not based on what you see right here. It knows the source, it knows the destination, it knows what domain it's ostensibly going to. If, that, if none of those things are on a blacklist, they're not on a poor reputation list, they're not denied for any other reason, then the decision is made to pass this traffic. It's good, go. From a client and server perspective, there's a little more here, right? So you've got the same information available, the source and destination IP. You've got the TLS, the SNI field that tells you what domain it's ostensibly going to. And then you have the decrypted HTTP. So this is the actual bits of what's going on that's going to be rendered back to the client. So there's another field inside HTTP called the host header. And the host header was introduced so that you could co-locate multiple web services on the same web server. It used to be that you could only put one web server, one web service on one web server. Because it was like, hey, port 80, I can't share port 80 between multiple things. Well, you can now. We introduced a host header that allows the client to specify which website it's actually trying to access. So now you can have a whole bunch of web services co-located on the same server, and the client distinguishes between those using that host header. So in domain fronting, what we see is a bastardization of that. So the source and destination IP are still there, and they still match up. And in this benign example, this is what happens every day in the real world, in non-fronted traffic, right? Destination IP address, oops. Destination IP address, SNI, and host header all agree. They're all going to the same place. No big deal, there's no harm here, there's nothing wrong. However, when we domain front, this and this can agree, but this can disagree. So now we've got a mismatch here. But understand that your web browser will not do this, right? Your web browser is programmed to make all of these things agree with each other. So in domain fronting, what we're doing is we're manipulating what's in here that none of those security controls can see unless you happen to be cracking open TLS at your perimeter. Um, and manipulating it. So what the content delivery network does when it sees this traffic come in, it decrypts the TLS. Yes, that's really the problem. The CDN is the endpoint. The CDN is who you're shaking hands with when you actually connect to something that's hosted on a CDN. 
You're not connecting with totallysafe.com, you're connecting with the CDN. And then inside the HTTP traffic, we can specify evil.com and guess which one of these the CDN is actually going to respect. It's going to respect what's in this, not this. So this is basically a lie, right? This can be true, but it doesn't have to be true. So what are the requirements to get started with domain fronting? If you want to use this, and you probably should, the first requirement is you have to have co-location on the content delivery network, right? You can't tell it to forward traffic to a server that you're running out of your basement, right? They, the content delivery networks will only shovel traffic for things for their customers, basically. So basically, you have to become a customer of the CDN. So you can set up your own web service on, you know, take your pick of providers, and that can be the back end for the domain front, no problem. Basically, basically all of the service providers uh, technically allow this to happen. As we'll touch on in a moment, it may or may not be wise to actually do it, but you'll see why that is in just a moment. And then the fronted domain has to exist. It can't be a fake thing. It can't be you know, just a string of characters. There has to actually be a real domain there. The attack machine with a listener has to field the connection that comes from the CDN edge. Um, and that attack machine, something has to be located on the CDN provider's network. But that, that connection can then be proxied back to something else. So you can eventually get back to the server that you're running out of your basement, but there's another hop in there that has to happen. Whatever feels the connection coming from the CDN edge has to be on the content delivery network, right? So alternatively, you can use a bridge or a proxy. There are some sort of prepackaged services out there that already exist, and they're free that you can use. So they've already constructed a bridge a backend that will field that connection for you, and you can use those things to browse the web or to connect back to something that you own. So that's pretty cool. So the other thing that you need is some sort of browser script tool. This can be a browser plugin. It can be some Python code that you wrote. It can be just about anything, really. Anything that you can do to create your own web requests can be used to do domain fronting. So little to no coding is required. If you can import a Python library, like requests or something like that, and construct a valid HTTP query and tell it to use TLS, you can probably do this. It's not, not super complicated. So there are a lot of tools already in existence that do this. So Cobalt Strike does it pretty much out of the box. PowerShell Empire can do this as well. Possible with Metasploit probably takes some configuration. You can obviously code this up in, in Python. It has to be possible in PowerShell. I, wanted, I haven't seen anybody do it in PowerShell except for PowerShell Empire. I would like to see some custom PowerShell script that will do this as well. So I'm planning to write that at some point. So architecturally, this is kind of what that looks like. Your, your, your attack machine lives on the CDN provider's network. Here's the edge node, the victim contacts your attack machine through that edge node. This is probably less likely to see in the wild because most attackers don't want to put all their tools out there on the CDN network because they do scan stuff. So if all of your tools are living on the CDN provider's network, uh, don't be surprised if it gets zapped. Right? This is the more likely machine uh, uh, scenario. So you're going to just put a proxy on there. That's all it's going to do is basically replicate what the CDN edge is doing, proxy that connection, and then send it back to somewhere else. So if your attack machine lives in another provider, you can connect back to that. If it's going back to your corporate network, if it's going back to your basement or whatever, it can do that. So let's talk a little bit about the use cases. So now we're getting into a little bit of uh, why this is controversial. So 
Historically, a lot of the people who have used domain fronting have used it to bypass security controls or free speech controls, right? So we're talking about political dissidents, we're talking about reporters who travel to like really unsafe, unfriendly places, heavily censored countries, anybody who needs to circumvent like free speech controls whose internet is, is heavily regulated. There's a lot of countries that fall into this category. Um, they are very hostile to domain fronting because it hides from their security controls. They do not like this. So there's a few messaging apps that do this. The Open Whisper apps, so WhatsApp and Signal support this. Uh, Telegram supports this um, and has subsequently been banned in a lot of countries because of its uh, use of domain fronting. There are several proxy networks that do this as well. So. Tor does this via the Meek plugin. So Tor Basic won't do this. You have to go enable. There's a couple of checkboxes you have to tick to get it to use the Meek plugin. And when you use the Meek plugin, it will um, use one of those pre-configured bridges. So the advantage of using that is you don't have to set up a backend on the CDN provider's network. Tor has already done that for you. Same thing with Siphon, Lantern, and there are several others out there. So just do some Googling if you're interested in poking around with any of those. So bad guys are, of course, they don't want to be left out of the party, so they're going to use this. They're going to exploit this behavior to bypass controls. So they can use this for command and control. They can use this for egress. They can use this for data exfiltration. There's if it's hiding from your security controls, why not, right? So, but as I said before, the only known case in public reporting anyway is APT29. And it's only been that one case as far as I know. Like, if, if it's happening other places, nobody's really talking about it. So, but I happen to know that a lot of pen testers are doing it as well. So, if you're a pen tester, you definitely need to learn this, and if you're a blue teamer, I would say you also need to learn this. So you can't really learn how to defend this very well without understanding how it works. So I would encourage you all to at least do the basic commands, do the basic steps that you need to demo this and, and, uh, and figure it out. So putting our blue team hat on, how would we identify this? So we're gonna, hypothesize that domain fronting is happening on my network, how would I know? Well, that's n <laughs> there's not a lot of hope on that front, unfortunately. So you can proxy TLS traffic, but in my experience, not that many people are actually doing that. There are a lot of reasons for that. In some cases, there are privacy concerns. So if your acceptable use policy, um, if it shields the, uh, your users from, from basically you snooping on their traffic, then that might not be an option. But also, there are technical risks to introducing a TLS proxy as well. Their track record in terms of security is not great. They introduce their own set of risks. So that's not a great option. It may not be feasible for everybody. Now, if you have it, if you have TLS proxy logs, then absolutely use them, for sure. But it's probably not viable for most people, I'm thinking. So from a blue team perspective, your, your standard like C2 detections, your beacon detections, your data exfiltration detections, um, all of those things are still in play, right? The, the traffic is not going to look tremendously different when it's fronted versus regular normal TLS traffic. So if if it's being used to exfiltrate data from your network, then you're gonna to wanna to look at the flows. You're gonna look at how many bytes left versus how many bytes came back. So you're gonna look at your producer to consumer ratios. Look for places where the normal ratio is flipped. So in a normal web browsing session, more data comes in than goes out, right? Because the only thing that's really going out is a request. That little request might pull back a whole bunch of data and so that is a very identifiable flow. If that equation is flipped and a bunch of data left the network and hardly anything came back, something's weird there. You need to look into that. Beacons, 
So a beacon isn't really going to behave any differently if it's domain fronted or not. You're still going to see some sort of regularity, right? Uh, really long running connections or really high volume connections are weird. So you got to do a little bit of math. You got to dig into it, but that's the job, right? Um, another th idea that I had was you could try to cross-reference the lists of frontable domains. So there's a few things out there that are available like on GitHub where they're collecting lists of frontable domains. So they're doing, there's a couple of scripts that you can use um, where you can just you know, query everything that's on a service provider and figure out what's frontable. So there's some people already that are creating big lists off of that. You can borrow that code fork it or whatever, do a, do a pull request and tinker with that code. You can maybe run that as a, at some frequency and pull in those lists of domains and then cross-reference your own traffic with those lists of domains and see if you can figure out if fronting might be happening in there. If any of those look really weird, if they're out of character for your network, then you might want to dig into it. Um, you could find other ways to fingerprint TLS, like the TLS cipher list signatures. So there's a project out of, uh, what's it called? The big uh, Salesforce. So there's, this, there's a, a team from Salesforce that created a project where they fingerprint TLS clients based on the ciphers that it offers to a server. So, and it turns out that it's, it's got a pretty good correlation. So um, fingerprinting TLS clients is a pretty effective way of identifying all sorts of badness. So that's pretty cool. You could start there as well. Although that's really not hard to fake either. So you could just use the same libraries that like Firefox uses or something and you'll, be, you'll look just like Firefox on the network. So none of these is a 100% solution, of course, but all of them are, could, could be effective to some extent. So your standard host-based detections and controls are also in play here as well. You're going to want to make sure that your application whitelisting, if at all possible. I know that's hard and it makes people cringe, but it is really effective when it's done well. So um, if, you're, if you're having problems doing it, like don't, don't give up. Keep fighting for it. It is doable. You're going to want to log everything that happens at the command line interface. You're going to want to log everything that happens in PowerShell. There, the, Microsoft has done a pretty decent job of putting forward uh, the ability to log almost everything that happens in PowerShell. And of course, there are ways to bypass those as well, but for sure you want to eliminate the lowest hanging fruit. So log everything that happens at the command line, log shell histories on your Linux and Unix servers, and centralize all that stuff. And um, I was also clued into just today the fact that there's um, there are API calls, there's uh, debug options that you can use in web browsers that will also log in, a, in debug form um, your host headers. So even in a TLS connection, you can log the host header and the SNI connection, uh, uh, the SNI field that a client is accessing. And that may probably, well, probably will be a part of some EDR tools at some point if they're not already. Somebody might have knowledge of, of one that actually does that already. <clears throat> so historically, um, I think this was really discovered back in 2012 by Bryce Bowe. So he wrote a blog post that established the, the fact that, that a, uh, you could basically access any of Google's services by talking to any of Google's servers. So you could do a DNS request of www.google.com and gmail.com and appengine.com or appengine.google.com or really any of Google's services, and you would get back different DNS responses. But you could send your request to any of those servers and get what you were looking for. So to sum that up, if you did a request to like App Engine, and you got back a list of servers, you could try to reach Gmail via those servers and you would still get there. So what he realized is that that host header and the SNI need not match. And that took a little while for somebody to figure out what to do with, but when they did, they came up with the Meek plugin for Tor. So that 
was the first appearance of the term domain fronting, so I, I credit the Tor project with, with coining the term. So that's pretty cool. So that's when they, they stood up the bridges and, and released that to the public. In 2015, the white paper dropped from UC Berkeley that, uh, that documented exactly how this thing works, and so it sort of exposed it to the world. At the same time in 2015, APT29 was using this in a large scale operation. In 2016, FireEye Mandiant, the firm that was called to respond to that incident, um, exposed it as well. So they, they had to wait until 2016 until their, their uh, contain and clear operation was complete to share it, but they shared it at ShmooCon and at DerbyCon later in 2016. So they were the ones that actually got in and got to see what this actually looks like on a network, and they exposed it. So that was pretty cool. In 2016, Open Whisper announced that they would support fronting on all of those service providers, basically all of them. Uh, there's, you can, you know, these are the ones that Open Whisper supports, but you can do this on pretty much anywhere. You can do it on OVH, you can do it on you know, all the other ones. You, foreign, domestic, whatever. I don't know of any service provider that has effectively shut it completely off. Right? So when they say that they've shut it down, I have mixed opinions about what that actually means. But in 2017, Optiv researchers blogged about fronting using Cobalt Strike. So that's a really good write-up. I would highly recommend you read that one. It's, it's fairly detailed. They used actual examples. They, they did it right there and you can replicate what they did. Uh, a month later, Raphael Mudge did a demo using Cobalt Strike using Malleable C2. So it's basically right out of the box. I mean, you have to configure the domains and such, so you have to get on the, the provider's network into your admin panel and do the setup. But once it's there, like it just works. So the code's already there. Um, and then in April 2018, Google killed domain fronting on App Engine. And what they really did was they shut down the people that were using this one particular web app to do this. So there was a popular web app that you could just go get off of GitHub, and that was the preferred way to do this um, back then. And so the people that were using that, Google just basically bl blacklisted that server, so you can't use that anymore. Um, and then. A little bit later, Amazon followed suit and did the same thing on CloudFront. And they're also making very clear that they see this as a violation of terms. So they don't want, they're making it very clear that they don't want you to do this. So in May of 2018, privacy advocates began petitioning Google and Amazon to allow domain fronting. So they want them to reverse that decision because of all the people that are using this for good. Um, they, they want them to reverse that decision and, and basically allow what amounts to a security loophole to exist. So uh, Amazon informed Open Whisper also in 2018 in, in no uncertain terms that they see this as a violation of the terms of service and they threaten to suspend the account. So that is, that is the method that they have chosen to shut down domain fronting. So they're making it very clear that they do not like it. They, 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 don't, they see this as an abuse of their system, and so that needs to be taken into an a, account. In the news, there have been a lot of headlines. There's even been a lot more since this. The, it's, it's slowed down a little bit, but there was a flurry in 2018 where a lot of, a lot of things were being said. You know, congressmen were being called, and there were sessions being held, and, and in committees in Congress and such. And um, so there was a lot of noise around domain fronting and there's a lot of shade being thrown around too. So there's, um, and that's partly why I really wanted to do this talk because I see so much shade and I see you know, aspersions and I see people questioning the motivation of, of other people and I don't see a lot of education and so I wanted to bring a little bit more education to the discussion and, and in so doing educate all of you so that you can go back and begin to educate others as well. So a lot of these 
headlines are written to be you know, deliberately uh, provocative. So you've got Amazon bends the knee to autocrats and, and threatens to cut off signal. It's like, um, you know, I, I, wish, I wish people would try to inflame less and try to be constructive more and just educate, right? You can, you can read whatever you want to into Amazon's actions, right? But the, the long and short of it is they have to answer to their customers. So they're gonna do what their customers want. So you know it's bad when the lawyers get involved, right? So now we've got Congress involved. Congress is, uh, there are several Congress members that are leaning on Amazon and Google to reconsider and, and reverse the decision to ban domain fronting. So let's talk a little bit about the risks. So there's some risks here for everybody involved. So for the clients, if you're trying to use domain fronting, it's illegal in some cases. So be really careful about how and when you do this. If you're a penetration tester, you've probably been read the Riot Act already about being really sure about where your traffic is going. If it's traversing countries where this is illegal, you've got a problem. If you have to call a lawyer, sorry, it's gonna be a bad day, right? So be really careful, make sure that your traffic is not going to places where it's going to be illegal. For defenders, the risks to you is that your network security controls that live at your perimeter and many of the ones that live on your hosts are very blind to this. Right? Unless you're doing a really, really good job analyzing your network traffic, you're not gonna see this. And even in that case, it's still really hard. We're talking about the very, very, you know, the smallest percentage of traffic. Um, and you're, you're inherently accepting some risk by trusting a service provider. So the, the trust model of you trusting the servers that you're trying to talk to is broken because in order to get to that server, you have to trust the entire provider network that that service lives on. And that's a problem. That's not documented, right, anywhere. So service providers also have some risk here, right? They're running a liability risk because they know of something that could be viewed as a security loophole, depending on who you are and how you look at this, and they're choosing not to do anything about it. So when they've talked about banning domain fronting, all they've really done is shut down some of the common avenues to do it. I know, happen to know a lot of pen testers that are still doing this, right? It, in some cases, it might be a violation of the terms, so be very careful about that. Don't do that, but if if it's not violating the terms or if it's ambiguous, do you think black hats are gonna take advantage of that? Yes, yes they will. So you need to be on that as well. So the service providers have some sort of unacknowledged liability here. I can foresee a day where somebody sues one of these service providers because they refused to close or effectively close a security loophole that they knew about and if it costs a, some company billions of dollars in loss, they might try to transfer that loss over to the service provider's network. But the good news is for black hats and for penetration testers like me, it's all win, right? We get to use this, not with impunity, but we do get to use it and it is cool. So what do we do with domain fronting? As a community, we need to figure out where we stand, right? So there's a few options here. We can, we can do nothing, we can leave it alone, we basically allow it to exist. That option might not be acceptable to everybody, but it would be good for the people that use domain fronting for good. So the people that are using Tor and such to ground security controls because they're reporting from places that are really hostile, you know, this, that, that option is good for them. They, they're firmly in that camp, right? But that's bad for all the people that are not acknowledging that domain fronting exists or don't know that it exists and they're inherently accepting that risk. Our job as security professionals is to align people's understanding of their risk with their actual level of risk. And if we're not pointing out this problem called domain fronting, we're not doing our job. 
So to organizational networks, that poses a real security risk that needs to be acknowledged. <clears throat> so the service providers could effectively, immediately affect domain fronting because they can change the way that they handle traffic. They could push out a code update tomorrow that would basically blacklist anything where there's that mismatch. So if the host header and the SNI field don't agree, drop that traffic. But that's not gonna happen. Why? Because domain fronting doesn't pose a big enough problem for them to really do anything about it yet. And I also suspect there are at least some cases out there where that behavior is the natural outcome. So to catch all of those cases, you know, maybe what they could do is whitelist certain combinations of host headers and SNI, but I don't think that's gonna happen either. That is a maintenance nightmare because somebody has to keep up with that whitelist. That's the, the drawback to whitelist is somebody has to maintain it. Um, they could continue to shut down the bridges, but that's just a game of whack-a-mole, right? They're just gonna keep on, hey, this is a problem, shut it down, shut it down, shut it down, but you can just continually spin up new bridges anytime you want. So there's no good solution here. The IETF, taking the long view here, they could do some stuff with the RFCs for TLS that would address this. However, they have no incentive to do so. And philosophically, they also have no reason to do so. So if you go read the, the TLS 1.3 RFC, says right up front, and this has basically been true of every version of TLS and go, even going back to SSL, their goal is to provide privacy, tamper-proof communications. So they don't care about you blue teamers that are watching your edge networks trying to figure out what's going on inside this encrypted stream. That is not their priority. Their priority is creating a secure protocol. So they're actually moving in the opposite direction. If you read everything that's in draft for TLS 1.3 right now, there's new, new things coming out all the time. TLS 1.3 is final, but there are some extensions and stuff that are still in draft. Um, it's moving in the exact opposite direction. Things that used to be in plain text in TLS, TLS 1.2 are now going to be part of the encrypted payload. If there isn't a technical reason for it to be in plain text, they're going to encrypt it. And so it's not, they're not spurning you blue teamers, but their goal is to provide private, private communications. So they're going to build that protocol as, as robustly as they possibly can. So that is their purpose, that's their stated goal. So why would you domain front? So red teamers, as I say, your job is to accurately emulate those risks that exist for your clients. So if that is in your threat model, if somebody who might attack you, your network, could use domain fronting, and I already demonstrated how easy it is to do, then you need to be prepared to emulate that threat as well. You don't need to use it in every case, and I would argue that you probably shouldn't use it in every case, but you need to be prepared. It needs to be a tool in your toolbox. And the real point here is to draw more attention to the issue, because if it starts to show up in more and more places, so it's already in the news a fair amount, it's being argued about in Congress on the Hill. It's being argued about in the media. It's been exposed. We're talking about it here. If it shows up in pen test reports, if it starts to actually affect companies' bottom lines, then I feel like the awareness of the issue will actually start to spread, right? I feel like it's not really fully appreciated at this point. We need to talk about it. We need to take it back to our companies, our organizations, our friends, neighbors, yes, bore everybody to tears. Uh, but if the issue arises in more places, I feel like something will happen eventually, right? We'll do something about it. So when should you use fronting? As in any tactic, I would say use maturity as the guide, right? Formulate some assessment of how mature you feel like this customer network actually is and then use it if you feel like you need to use it. Or if you're trying to egress a network 
and they're doing a really good job stopping near traffic. Like you set up one C2 channel and an hour later it gets popped because they caught it for some reason. So you try another method, that gets popped because they caught it, right? You might need to escalate to domain fronting. So use it as an escalation, right? If you happen to know because you've tested this customer before that they're really good at catching regular C2 stuff, then you might want to start with it just to save time. But I would say use it only as required. And as I said before, I just want to reinforce that. You blue teamers, you really need to know how this works too. You can't really learn how to defend against this stuff until you see the nuts and bolts yourself. So I'm not saying you need to go out and start coding something in Python and put code on GitHub, but you should definitely at least go out there and start doing some curling, right? Curling is pretty easy. It's a part of a lot of these demos that are uh, in the last slide of the presentation. It's not hard to do, and it's very easy to see how it's working. So this is a very stealthy method that you don't always need to use. However, understand uh, when it comes to reporting, I don't really have any great advice for you because usually in a pen test finding, you, you get to tell them how to mitigate this thing, right? When it comes to domain fronting, there's not a whole lot of hope yet, right? So I don't know what to tell them other than, are you looking for C2? Are you looking for beacons? Are you analyzing your flows to look for really odd shapes? If you're not doing any of that stuff, like, you know, you don't need a domain front, obviously. But if you're not at least at that maturity level, I, I don't know what to tell you. And also, like, a, a critical finding in a lot of cases can, can stop things from happening, right? It can stop networks from being certified and such, if it's, to, if it's a compliance pen test in, in PCI or FISMA or FedRAMP or something like that. So critical findings can be showstoppers, right? So be careful about labeling something like this a critical finding because there's no patch, there's no configuration, there's no appliance that they can go buy that just solves this problem. You can't just tell them, here's, a, here's the solution, implement this and you'll be good. You can't do that. But Every time we talk about it, every time we raise it, every time we put it in a pen test report, if we interview with the media, we talk to our local groups, we talk to our local meetups and whatnot, we're raising awareness of the issue and we're educating people. So please do that and do it humbly and do it in the spirit of educating people and not throwing shade. So, this is my chance to speculate wildly on the future of domain fronting, so take all of this with a grain of salt. I'm, I am no expert, really, but my hypothesis is that uh, it probably won't last forever, forever. I think that eventually this is going to become a reputation problem for the service providers. So already, like the upper crust of service providers are, are moving against this and they're saying, we don't like domain fronting, we don't want domain fronting, it's a problem. So they're stating that sort of out of the box. So they're probably going to set the tone for everybody else. Now as far as actually doing anything about it, there, you know, there's not a whole lot, like it's still possible, right? But um, I feel like at some point their reputation is gonna be on the line and eventually they are going to take more steps technical steps to actually control and prevent this from happening. The problem I see with that, though, is that I see this as a step towards a 100% attributable internet. And that's, that's my term, attributable internet. I don't know if that makes sense to anybody else, but what I mean by that is I like the fact that even though you have to jump through some hoops, you can still be fairly private online. You can still be fairly anonymous. An internet where privacy is not a thing really scares me because that gives the, the powerful people in the world something to beat up on the weak with. And that really bothers me. So while there will be new tactics in the future, People are gonna find new ways around controls, right? Domain fronting won't be the last time somebody figures out how to proxy traffic through a legitimate service. 
It will happen again. Then the, the sensors will come down and they will stop that too. And then smart people will figure out another way around that. It's, it's, it's just going to keep going. It's a cat and mouse game, right? So there's all this back and forth. But understand that the RFCs will continue to favor privacy. So your security controls, unfortunately, are not going to be super effective. As I said before, the TLS 1.3 moves everything after the hello into the encrypted payload. And even some of the fields that used to be in clear text and TLS 1.2 are now in the encrypted payload as well. So there's also a new, uh, a new extension of the RFC for the encrypted SNI, which is coming soon. It's, it's in draft, um, but Boring SSL has already implemented it as it is. It's, as I say, it's a draft, so it could change. But that offers another way to basically lie about where this traffic is going. So effectively, it's a lot like domain fronting, but it's not domain fronting as it's traditionally been known, if you can say the word traditional when it comes to domain fronting. So the wrap up. Um, I would like to propose a plan of action for all of us here. Uh, one, learn it. Get into the demos, see how easy it is to do and replicate. Figure out what's actually going on. Study the topic from the perspective of risk versus cost. Right? Figure, out what you un, uh, figure out what you think about this and what we could, should, might do about this. And then share that knowledge with others. Right? Put it in your pen test reports. Put it in your risk assessments. Put it in. Um, everything that you possibly can, right? Explain this to your boards, explain this to your security managers, your PMs and such. Formulate a, a strategy and implement it. So that goes for people on every side of the house, right? We, uh, risk is the one thing that sort of defines all of us and what we do as security professionals. So if you're coming into this field, if you're new to the field, or if you're looking to get into the field, thank you, thank you, thank you all so much for being here. The fact that you are here is really, really cool. I love this community. I really appreciate that all of you guys have taken the time to come down here and to learn something and to better yourselves, because the future of our way of life really depends on it. And I really appreciate um, all of you guys being here, and um, if, you're, if you're looking at all this stuff and you, you don't feel super motivated to do something about it, this might not be the field for you, right? So the fact that you are here is really cool and really meaningful. So I appreciate um, all of you coming and, and uh, listening to my, my stupid talk, and <laughs> um, thanks for being here. And so just a final note for you defenders, learn how to detect this. Penetration testers, learn how to use it. But above all, voice your opinion. And as always, be excellent to each other. So get your QR code readers out if you're interested in these links. It's all um, in a gist. So, and I'll also I'll put the slides wherever slides go. Um, so you should be easy to find. Um, after the fact, if you're at all interested. So there's some really good write-ups in there and demos of how to do this. Um, are there any questions? Do we have any? no time for questions? OK, so I'll be around. So thank you. Thanks.